Namaste, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. We're so glad to have our live audience and our virtual audience here to celebrate Colin Winnett's new book, Users. So Colin's books have included Coyote, Can't Stay, and Job of the Wasp, which got a lot of accolades. It was an ABA Next pick. His writing's been in Playboy, McSweeney's. We were a whole bunch of publications. And uh, what really delights me, he's also a former bookseller. So that automatically makes him dear to our hearts. Um, you know, gosh, all over the place. Vermont, New York, California. Uh, and Julia Dixon Evans is our conversation partner. And we're so proud to have Julia. She's the author of How to Set Yourself on Fire. Um, she's also had work in the screening, um, the fiction, the essays, and the literary hub, paper darts, and ton of publications. Julia is a public media journalist who covers digital arts, music, culture, um, dance theater for QPBS, NPR, and our local PBS here in San Diego. Um, she's got some great conversation coming up with us. And so let's give them a big hand and thank you all for coming. He finished his drink, 
and her eye in the very narrow gap between her foot and his knee. You only need to shift an inch or two to close it. Statistically, she said. Okay, he only kills me. I'd leave for a few weeks, she said. Pay someone to clean up, then move on. Come on, he said. I don't have a lot of years left, she said. And two dollars to raise. Plus, you could have done something about the threats years ago, and you chose to ignore them. That's on you. She shifted herself upright, away from his knee. My turn. You're 46, he said. The woman's sexual peak, she said, tapping her glass to make it sing. I don't believe you, I said, and choose not to. She set her hand in his and lifted it to kiss his knuckle. It's true, she said. And then as if to prove it, she said, I was going to leave you in Texas. It wasn't sure he'd heard her right. His pen went slack as he re-examined what she'd said, wishing he could diagram it like a sentence in English class, though he couldn't remember why or how that was done. Leave me in Texas. Like an outlaw, he said, blinking. Like a departure, she said. A separation. My sister worked it out while we were planning the trip. I would propose a hike on the edge of Big Ben, something you and the girls would be happy to avoid. Instead, I would drive toward New Mexico, and she would drive toward Texas, and we would meet halfway and drive back together. And her voice came out there. She moved her hands, encouraging him to take it, but he could only stare at it like an inanimate object that had suddenly come to life in his palm. He had no idea how to help it. Your sister, he said. She didn't think I could do it alone, she said. Bullshit, he said. Calm down, she said. I'm not leaving. But you wanted to, he said. I was going to, she said, but I didn't, and I'm not. You're not, he said, but you wanted to. Exactly, she said. But what happens next time, he said, now that you've practiced? You aren't listening, she said. And, he said, you're saying how quickly the winds can change. I'd better watch my step. No, she said. I'm saying I'd like to love you. But, he said, I should be it hard, she said. Miles felt his skin slipping off. His bones had quit too. He'd be nothing but a mess of hair and organs and blood after this, and she would like to love him. I think it's fair, he said, to want to be able to live my life without feeling that I'm about to lose you to a grocery trip. A hike, she said. And you wanted me to know all this for what? He said, you wanted to leave, and now you're not, and you'd like to love me, and you wanted me to carry all this around with me for the rest of my life for what? This is what you asked for, she said. This is not what I asked for, he said. It's what you ask for all the time, she said. What do I ask for, he said. How I feel, she said. You asked me to tell you, so this is how I felt. Well, shit, he said. It's a little late. The sympathy in her face evaporated, leaving only a pair of rolling eyes. And in that moment, Miles saw his wife again. The animal in his palm became a hand, her hand, and he clutched it. Okay, he said. Um, you said it. What did I say? She said. You'd like to love me, he said. That's not it, she said. That's exactly what you said. He said, I heard it. But what I meant, she said, what I'm saying is that I hope you can appreciate it. Appreciate what, he said. What you asked for, she said. How I feel. Okay, he said. Considering only then how he felt about what she'd said. Okay, I appreciate it. Appreciate what, she said. I appreciate what you're saying, he said. And I was to see in her face that none of these were the right words. Or if they were the right words, they were the right words said the wrong way. He felt confused, as if the night had tricked him. He'd been lied to by wine, and he felt angrier about it than he wanted to feel. Miles watched his wife start to speak, but stop herself. And in that silent moment, they both understood that if she could accept what he was saying right now, as he'd said it, if she could take it at face value, she would at least be allowing herself the hope that he might be the kind of person who wanted to do the thing he was describing, who wanted to appreciate how she felt. And perhaps the best option was to leave it there, even if the opportunity for that hope was all that was really on offer. Okay, Miles, she said, pumping his head once to let it go. Okay, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
presentations and like all of that, and it's a completely um, all all encompassing, but certainly like massively, massively effective uh, shift in our relationship. And it all has to do with like a subtle thing changing in the way we communicate because communication is so so important and it's so integral to having our own individual identity and the way we. Uh, exist and like think about each other, and when you just change the way you talk with someone or the way you're allowed to speak with someone, there's just effects that just ripple out. Uh, yeah. So that's a, that's a big part of the book. It's, it's like this anxiety about uh, fucking with human communication, <laughs> like irresponsibly, unthoughtfully. Uh, yeah. um. I, of course, before we get into more about that, um, I want to talk about the company that he works for. The slogan, the slogan for this particular product is um, Dream It and It's Yours. I love that also, I you know that an intern came up with it and they just like, built up a company on the intern's back. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the program, like what it does and what they're pitching to you. Society to get them to use their product. Yeah, so in the beginning of the book, it is a ultimately like a customizable reality. So it's like individually, these like original experiences is what they're called. And it's something that you would go into and you would sort of like a sandbox and create whatever you want. And the company finds that ultimately people are bored in themselves in this like kind of infinite sandbox. So they start creating original or they, they start creating what they like. Uh, rather than user generated content, the company starts generating content that's meant to kind of spark the imagination of the user community. Uh, and that's where we're at when we meet Miles. He's created this extremely popular spark called the Ghost Lover that is like uh, the art experience that recreates your life exactly as it is, only you're being haunted by the ghost of the next lover. And it kind of blows up. But at the same time, they're taking down all these people are using it to do really awful things and create new spray dungeons and like just like fucking dark dark corners of the internet that you see almost every sort of new tool kind of get turned toward the darknesses of uh, you know, stability or whatever. Um, and companies are removing those, and so then the users come back very intensely, being like, "Well, you know, if you're saying that there's no, like, if you're taking consent issues with our big dungeons and our VR experiences, well, we raise one in response to the ghost lover because haunting is not a consensual experience." You know, it's a bad faith argument, like an option of like good language to make a bad faith argument to protect ultimately something that's pretty morally abhorrent. Um, and Miles' response to that is, "Okay." They're mad at the company saying that there's a sense of shit thing happening here. So what we will change about this, uh, our experiences, is that now users can influence each other's experiences. So it's not just this individual experience where you're in there building a kind of world or living some kind of world that's been built for you. Now Julia can step into mine and change whatever she wants about it. I can step into Julia's and change whatever I want about it. And you can decide like, where that where the creation is coming from, whether or not it's your idea or someone else's idea or someone else's desire. And so Miles' point ultimately is that like once we've done this, any censorship that we do, <laughs> like, well, we continue to like censor this stuff because then well this is y'all and you know the users are in total control. Uh, so like it's not necessarily coming from the company if it is. Um, and he's just building this entirely to protect himself from the yeah, user outrage that he's developed in the beginning. And other than like this, uh, sort of like discussions on the, between coworkers, almost like murmurs between coworkers, we don't actually see the users. We don't see anyone using this software. We don't see who these people are. Um, why, why do these people matter so much to you? So miles, so this book, to the story, like, but uh, I'm being so silent otherwise. Yeah, uh, I mean, they matter in a, in just from, like, from the company perspective, because it's like if they're on, they, 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 if we don't maintain this number and continue it growing, mm-hmm. we lose, like, uh, we lose ground as a company. We lose, you know, eventually losing shareholder interest. Um, but at the early stages, people are deleting, you know, it's like the whole, like, um, 
whatever we're thinking you're doing, you're doing, you're doing, you're doing, you're doing, you're doing this. Um, I think they're calling it, they have like a hashtag kill the green. I think I'm thinking it's really hashtag kill the green. And so that's the issue they're trying to deal with. It's like, it's not so much they care about the individual people at all. It's just like our daily active user number is going down. And that's the metric that we use the whole time. They're like, show the people who are giving us money to do all of this mm-hmm. that we are a valuable and important contributor or whatever, that we can make the money, basically. Um, but it's, interesting, it's an interesting question because I did write like, a whole second half of the book that was like, from the perspective of one user and like, their life. Um, and I liked it, but I didn't think it was particularly like, a strong addition. It was more like something I needed to imagine for myself. Um, because ultimately, the, the perspective of the novel is really close to Miles. And I was like, and Miles is experience, these aren't people, these are like numbers, and then only people, when the numbers start to like turn against him, and then it's like pressure, and he's someone who, you know, he can barely relate to the people he loves, like, you know, that's a big part of the community convention in the book, is that until Miles is really realizing that he's, like, completely alienated himself from his wife, that he, like, starts calling her by her name, you know? Yeah. And there's some of the daughters. And there's some of the daughters, yeah, yeah. Um, I think in terms of in terms of tech, but also in those relationships, this book got me thinking about our collective relationships with, with trauma, with past trauma, um, and and you know you see it with Miles' his life, his software about the ways that those traumas could be inadvertently or intentionally mine. Um, and like, and what do you what is our collective responsibility, and especially as tech companies increasingly realize, like, what is our, as a collective, as a society, like, what is our responsibility to each other in our, in our traumas? Ooh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I mean, it's more like that's what you're becoming, right? Um, yeah, it's definitely what I was thinking about. It's, it's a huge question that is motivating to generate the creation of the book. And um, uh, I think, like, the closest thing that I could come to to answering that without getting, like, super precise about the particular, like, actions one would take, uh, although, like, you know, we all have, like, particular actions that we would take that might express something that I'd like to say, um, that might be accounting for the thing I'd like to say. But there's a scene toward the middle of the book where Miles kind of goes out and gets drunk with this talent, talent management character, right? who is like, oh, that's great, I love it. But he's like, he's kind of like the devil at the same time, you know? Um, but his, like, you know, his role in the company ultimately is they have certain users who are generating popular content. And he's just like basically like the liaison who manages all those people. He's like, don't leave our VR company and go to another VR company, stay here, we'll give you like, you know, free water bottles and shit, or they tell you you're a genius. Um, and it's all designed to kind of like nudge people to keep staying, to remain on their platform, generating free content for them. Um, and he's talking to Ted, Miles talking to Ted, and he's just like, feels, Miles was very good in the scene, right? Because he's very drunk, but also because he's got someone who's like an acolyte and really likes, you know, is kind of being like, you're great, you're brilliant, like you've done all these great things. And like, uh, and Miles keeps being like, keeps being like, you're good at this, you're good with people, you're good at this. Like, how do you do that? And Ted says, uh, like the thing with people is that everything goes somewhere. Um, I think that's all you have to do. And for me, that's like, I was like, Ted is the devil, but also this is true. You know, like every, the way this sort of goes back to like the, the ways in which we communicate effectively in our relationships, um, like the devices we use to talk, like and the way we talk, and all that matters on an emotional and psychological level. And that's not to say like one is superior than the other, but definitely to pay attention to the effect of those things, especially when we're in the position of like changing them. Um, and so yeah, just like for me, like that would be the that's the act that I try to take uh, among many others. When you look at my um, is to just remember that when people all go somewhere, it's like there's a it's you know yeah, there's your it's pebble in a pond, you know, like it matters. Everything you're doing is being stored somewhere. And it goes back to this issue of like haunting. I just like, you know, talking about trauma, not even just like the, the huge major traumas, but even those small little moments in our life that just like get lodged in our psyche and we walk around with for the rest of our uh, 
the rest of our days, you know, um, and remembering that dream's power to kind of come interact with other people, um, not only in your input into their life, but also in how you hear what they're you know, giving to you, you know, um, in conversations. And that's what one of his greatest weaknesses is that he is constantly being presented by his wife, by his kids, by his coworkers with like solutions to problems he's having with them. He'll just be like, what you need to do for me is this. And he's like, um, yes, but how does that relate to the problem that I brought to you before you start talking about it? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's a really good segue. Because I wanted to ask you that really, um, I, I mean, generally just like that coworker relationship I and mean, the work culture, the office culture, this tech job, um, which I was fascinated by. And it, I, I wanted to know, like, what the worst job you've ever had was. The worst job I've ever yeah. had. Uh, wow. Worst job I've ever had. Um, I'm going back all now that I know you I'm wondering if it's before tech or oh, definitely before tech. I mean, probably the worst job I ever had. Oh, I don't know. Yes. Like, what do you count? Like, what do you count? I mean, uh, I worked as a pizza delivery driver for a while when I was in high school for about two weeks. It was very, very bad. It was horrible. It was extremely stressful. I was very bad at it. Um, and the whole time, and the way that bad is actually my father just being like, you know, that people only order pizza so they can like, grab you and drag you to their house and zip tie you and take whatever money that you have on you. And he told me this, like, every time they came home, I was like, this is not happening. I keep delivering pizzas and it keeps not happening. He's <laughs> like, he was waiting behind the store. Every door you knock on. Um, so I was like, I have to leave this job. Um, but, but like, that was just, that was a tough job because you were wearing polyester. I mean, it was a really tough job. I was like, digging a ditch. But like, uh, it was just like hot. I was in Texas, but air conditioning didn't work. I was wearing polyester. It was a Domino's delivery job. Uh, and the car was just like a hot car, dark car. You go over sunlight and warmth, and then also giant baked pieces. Uh, so just, and I was like a pretty heavy kid, so I was sweating all the time. You know, I was like sitting there, like baking, and then having to walk up to a door. Like, my father is a night before convinced me. <laughs> like, am I even in two? I'm just like, closing my eyes and knocking. Um, so that was, that was not fun. Um, but I've done like way less, uh, like, that was pretty stimulating at the end of the day. Um, like, uh, you know, I imagine like it's a young, younger writer. You had some of these like tech, technical writing jobs or like writing, I like, write like websites for dentists, you know. And this, like, kind of was talking to him about this earlier, <laughs> like, you have to kind of, like, disassociate physically and just, like, drift off into this, like, I'm writing about dental implants for the, like, hundredth time today. Like, you cannot, like, actually engage with this girl. Jump back with him. So, how did that disappoint us? And I mean, also knowing that, like, the him going to work and you having to figure out what he did was, like, this really, um, how does how did your experience with work inform um, Miles' experience and Miles' circumstance there in his job? Yeah, um, a lot of the details uh, in certain ways are pulled from life, but it's also it's an interesting thing where it was like so I worked for uh, in the last few years I started working as a writer for mobile games. So there's a certain amount of the overlap there, just in terms of like the creative structure and the pipeline and not the way the company uh, functions. Um, and when I started writing it though, it was like I'm gonna take these little nuggets of real life and like super exaggerate them into this like hyperbolic exaggeration that's ultimately what felt satire, you know, so like absurd. And then by the time we were editing the book, it was like meta was announced. And like all these new guys, I mean, every major tech company was like, here's our VR. This is our future. You know, you will be living in our VR world. Um, and I was just like, oh shit, like, uh, hey, my book just got like way more popular than we have. But I suddenly felt like this real sense of urgency 
to there. Yeah, so what I did was I took real things and exaggerated them, and now reality is kind of catching up with that exaggeration. So I need to like study reality again, and so I had to start like, looking at uh, you know, like product launches for VR companies and like all the, the ways that the, and like timelines for how products are shaped and um, stuff that I'm really not interested in. You know, uh, I just suddenly felt like there was like I was like no responsibility to reality in a way that I never like my other books are so intentionally like obscured. You know, in terms of time and place. Uh, and this one just suddenly felt like, well, it's, it's going to invite such direct comparisons to now that I have to start thinking about now. Uh, <laughs> which I hate doing. I want to talk about the people and uh, the relationships as well. And I, I think you're such like this immersive character. Like, um, like we, I. The same with um, the job of the law school is too. Like, I kept forgetting that it like, wasn't happening to me. Like, I wasn't miles, which was a terrible state of being sometimes. But um, I, I wanted to ask you about how you have made even like the cringiest dysfunctional marriage, um, parenting relationship, co-worker relationship, all of that. Like, how do you approach those in a way that makes them relatable? Um, I'm just to get relatable. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's tough. Like, yeah. it's relatable, you know, um, in a way. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. It's like, there's just certainly the, the craft tactic of, like, I try not to let the novel create distance between the character, the sort of central character perspective and the perspective of the book. In the sense that it's like not like doing the omniscient narrator thing, or not doing the kind of like we're in his head, but like we'll pull over this guy, you know, like some books are very like that. Because I was like, ultimately, my tactic with it that was, was really similar with this, got really lost, actually, was to be like, I'm just kind of completely wed uh, the perspective of the book and the sort of like kind of drive of the narrative to the character who's in the center that is like kind of sort of revealing all this stuff to us. And the job of lost is in first person. Um, and so, like, at times, there's a, a kind of, like, potentially the reader might wonder, like, does the book feel this way, you know? And, and the opportunity for me, rather than, like, creating distance there or, like, kind of, like, jumping to another character's head or something, was to just populate the world of the book around that main character with, uh, with characters who, like, pretty powerfully puncture it what their, the narrative that they're presenting us. So that we have Miles' perspective, we're very, very close to it, and like, eventually you get kind of just caught up in that situation of them just listening to someone justify their own thinking to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then someone will come along and kind of be like, you know, stab a hole right through it, so the reader has that spot of light, and, but it's not coming from the, the novel, it's coming from this other character, which for me always makes, weirdly makes the, like, the distance between reader and story much, much narrower, you know, mm -hmm. um, versus, like, the other approach of kind of having the novel zoom out or something or having the novel remind you that it doesn't feel the way that the character who's talking feels um, in some louder way or some other direct way. That, for me, always puts more time, like, oh, right, I'm reading the book, you know, mm -hmm. which can be a great, you know, chance. There's some writers who are masters of that, like, zoom out way. Um, and create a completely uh, moving thing for doing that. But I'm always very interested because I'm so a huge excitement for me to look how trapped are we in our own like heads and thought loops and um, can we like, how do you break out of that? And it's part of the perspective thing. Just saying, I'm like paying attention to what's being said to you know, <laughs> by other people. Yeah. I have one more question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Amelia Gray's books and yeah. acknowledgments, and um, it, there's, I mean, clear homage, a little pastiche with the, the way that Miles kind of takes care of his death sets, um, and like the structure of them as well. And maybe, could you talk about that? Like the, the use of the, the, the homage to threats? Yeah, well, it's like ever, so Amelia Gray has this great book, Threats, where it's like uh, a guy whose wife dies. And then starts receiving threats that seem to be coming from her. Uh, and so it's like he has a relationship to them that's very, like, uh, conflicted. <laughs> um, and it's very beautiful. Um, and so, but I used to, like, I would go 
see him and they read, and she would just read, to just read the breaths, and it was just like this extremely powerful, uh, like feverish, you know, <laughs> presentation. They always had that in my head. Um, as like, you know, this like a seven million dollars one, so just like teaching me like the raw power of like a handful of well-chosen words or something. Um, also, it was a, we have to the fact that she writes great short stories, but, um, but uh, for me, the press in the book were honestly from this place of like, I keep, when I'm writing a story, I keep being like, how do I, how do I justify doing this when I'm about to die? You know? <laughs> Not that I'm about to die, like, I'm going to die tomorrow. Or staring at them, you know, uh, so that, that, that's, that's its waiting. Um, and so it's like, for this book in particular, it was like, Almost like a way of motivating me to write the book. So just like the opening line in the book is your heart will stop. <laughs> I wrote that and I was like, I got it. So you gotta write something that can <laughs> like your heart's gonna stop. Um, so it, in a sense, like that's really obviously where it came from. <laughs> and uh, I said, okay, cool, I'm gonna use this uh, a little bit structurally and the way that I'm going to uh, it's a slightly different approach to it, um, hopefully. But uh, but then it's kind of like, as the break we got, as you guys heard in the section that I read, like his relationship to Gucci is because he said, well, I'm not, like, I had this urgency of, like, the sense that I'm staring at in the face or whatever, like, I'm going to die, someone's telling me they're going to kill me. Uh, and yet, like, I'm still alive. I'm not dying. So I can't totally operate from this place of, like, death is immense, you know, I must uh, purely react as a, a good, uh, a threatened animal. Uh, because actually, weirdly, my life's getting better. I'm like, I'm doing really well. <laughs> and so then Miles almost starts to be like, the death threats are kind of like, great. They're like my little, like, you know, it's the world cheering me on. Like, there's a section later where it's like, uh, like, it was, it's like sweet to pick up this person still checking in with them after all these years. <laughs> um, and ultimately, like, the, the death the threats do sort of catch up with them, and it doesn't, you know, not in the way that you might expect, but like, um, that is related to his downfall. Um, but yeah, so it was like that negotiation of like this urgent situation of mortality with the fact that like from the same hand, like you're alive until you're not, you know, so it's like what are you doing that time? You can't just be focused so much on the end of that. Um, that you like lose sight of like the giant decisions you're making that are affecting people around you all day. <laughs> Okay, well, I have another question, but you all should be thinking about your own questions to ask of Colin. Oh, yeah, I have one more. But I'll call on you first. <laughs> Start filming them. But, um, sort of related. But, uh, what else were you reading, um, like, kind of in the lead up to this book or while you were writing or, like, that break between writing and editing? Um, I'd love to know, like, what else was floating around your head? Yeah. The biggest, this is like a really weird thing to say because books are so different, but the, the biggest influence for me was the sellout, the Paul Beatty book. Um, have you read it? No. Oh, it's great. It's, like, it's hilarious. It's a wonderful book. Um, and there's just, it's like definitely heavy satire, but not in like, I don't know, it's, like, it's kind of wacky. Like there's like wacky things in it, but it always has this very like uh, serious, human, sad uh, core. And I was just very impressed by the ability of the book to to walk that line of like this is so funny and so sad and so un- surreal and so real at the same time. Uh, and so that was a weird like I really wanted and that's right the same book that Paul Beatty wrote, but to just try and figure out how uh, to accomplish something that feels so much like life, you know, where there is all these kind of these things at once. Um, and so that was a big one. Um, and also, like, that approach to satire. Again, that's not the, like, get rid of this, but more just, like, I'm presenting this, and it's all this sort of like the office, where you're just like, oh, it's, like, too real, and it's also hilarious at the same time. Um, and it's also it's very human, but it's also, like, way over the top, you know, not the American office, like that. Um, but the, uh, so that was a big one. Uh, the other book, weirdly, uh, that was, like, a huge influence on the middle of that book, like, the TED section, and, and uh, all sort of, all, like, the, the hinge before the, like, second half, uh, was Anagrams by Laurie Moore. Um, it's this, 
like I think it's her only novel. If it's not, maybe it's her first novel. Um, and it's old, it's weirdly like I knew a bunch of collection of short stories, but in each short story, the sort of three main characters of this husband, wife, and daughter that keep kind of like roles keep kind of shifting, and it's like husband, wife, daughter, husband, wife, girlfriend, like you know, just like this kind of recasting of these people, and it's like over the course of the book, especially when she calls it a novel, you start to sort of like uh, you know build those comparative bridges that we were talking about <laughs> and fill in that space. Um, and it creates, I don't know, like it's almost like a magic eye where it's like a secret third thing emerges. <laughs> uh, and so yeah, there was some, and it was just something in her writing uh, that's so fun and light and like remarkable uh, that I was very moved by and also just like the way that book, the, the ultimate kind of uh, yeah, that magic I think that I just said that it'll be affected that and wanting to do that to some degree this way. Um but no like tech really books or anything like that. <laughs> that didn't really happen. It was mostly just like videos of guys giving speeches about this being like the biggest day of their life and for humanity as well. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And they'd be like pretending I'm not camera. <laughs> A new camera lens on a phone, you know. I also do a lot of music while I write. I listen to particular uh, kinds of music when I write. very different from like, what I would listen to when not writing. And part of that is like, there's lyrics I can really pull away. Um, if there's something like, you know, I don't know, it gets announcing itself to me. And so kind of, there's any kind of narrative trajectory to the music that I generally will pull me out if there's like a shredding guitar solo or something impressive like that or something. Um, so I will listen to like, I think like, every writer listens to this immigration loops, like the Williams is like, uh, stuff, or I listen to that a lot. I listen to, um, but it's boring and their club of gore. Do you know that at all? Uh, I think it's a German band, but I might have that wrong. Like Eastern European. Um, and it's like just very, this one album they have called Piano Nights. It's like this very like, heavy metal, but slowed way down and chill. Um, not like German metal, though. Like a kind of like a little like more nightclub in a way, but not, there's no like nightclub vibes. It's just kind of like a little bit. Um, is it piano? Is it? It is not. I don't think. I don't think mean, there is. It's like, so I think it's like, like I think I read, I should need to read more about them. It was just an album that I was, a, my friend Chris recommended to write right. to, and I'm right, right. Uh, but I was reading something that said that a lot of the sounds are made from like, uh, like, Autopsy tools, songs, and stuff like that. Um, which is not like horror music, but there is something really unsettling about it. So I wonder if that's part of it. Like, it's, um, that there, that it's like machinery, and that it's like, you know, so close to death, like the machinery. Um, but, um, yeah, those, listen to those a lot. And I listen to um, this experimental musician named Lake Mary, I think is this person's name. Um, it has this album called Mule. It's like kind of like experimentally western y, uh, kind of like uh, uh, like very, it's very like um, landscape oriented music. Um, kind of like just creates a kind of like imaginative space. It doesn't like necessarily fill in the narrative or fill in anything like um, authority, the authority to it. It's more just like here's a place to kind of like wander around it and then imagine what you want to imagine and sort of like these new experiences. And yeah, stuff like that. It's like, yeah, I did make a, a large hard board playlist that was like songs for the thing and you were going to laugh in other rooms like Randy and then radio had it. <laughs> but um, that was not like music I listened to when I wrote. It's just like these are songs that like I think are in company with the book. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah.
definitely. Um, I love this cover. Like, it, it was a, it took a long time to to get to that matter. So we did a lot of different things. We did like icons, you know, like a company's icons, but then they did one cover that was like the egg, which is this product in the book called the egg. That's like this giant machine that you climb into and it like moves your arms and legs so you don't have to like you know walk around your house and be on helmet anymore. You can just sit back and like uh, you just live in this magical experience. Um, and so they did like a cover that was like the old, I guess, sort of like a oleaginous egg that was like goo dripping down it. And I was like, I don't know what it is about my books that like every every cover designer is like, you gotta get bodily fluids on it. <laughs> but I was like, I don't know, maybe we could try something like it felt like we captured something in the book, but it also made the book feel a lot like darker. And it's a very dark book, but hopefully it's funny and hopefully it's, uh, it's like tender. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Siri, you were talking to speak up. <laughs> She's listening in. Yeah. Um, she, yeah, see any questions, Siri? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so we went back and forth a lot from each other, and we said a lot of different things, and there was something... I mean, I don't know, all my covers are, they wind up looking very dark, you know? Something's always like dead. Is it pink? And pink, yeah. It looks pink, dark and pink. Dead <laughs> organs and flesh, yeah. And so when I finally said this, I was like, hey, it's very lovely to me. There's something very promising about it. Um, very pretty. But then there's just also something really unsettling about it. But I think part of it is like, I don't think, what am I looking at exactly? Um, it feels like a, it's like, it feels a little bit like Miles' house where the end where it's like the interior spaces and exterior spaces winding through each other. And like, uh, just the, the reality feeling so, like, so it's simple. It's an arch with a circle, you know? But then they, um, they're like, oh, wait, it's a circle of sun, this is a mountain, this is a door, this is my inside, my outside. Um, and that disorientation created that settling feeling in me that I was like, oh, it's so nice to have that unsettling feeling be hidden underneath this very, like, soft pinks and purples and, and lovely, uh, elegant composition that sort of 90s throwback, you know, uh, versus the other way around of, like, there's this horrific thing because I can't grab it. <laughs> like, it's also got people with feelings in it, you know. Uh, so it was like a nice subversion of that, that thing. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, it's a little, it was a long conversation, I realize. Yeah. Brian, you had a question? Yeah. You can't know. Do not tell them I read this one. <laughs> it's a secret. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of funny, actually. One of my, uh, one of the mobile games that I worked for uh, before, my boss from that job came to the LA reading. <laughs> he was like, what do you think the scariest part of working in Texas is? <laughs> I was like, you. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, hopefully... Again, like it is not a uh, like a savage takedown of the tech industry that's like all this evil with full of monsters. Uh, in fact, it's like kind of like grappling with something that I think a lot of people who work in that industry grapple with, and it's just an unpacking of like the way some of these people in these situations think and worry and orient themselves in relationship to the things they have to kind of account for to to live the life they're living. They're living. Um, and I'm one of those people. Um, and so ultimately, it's been very interesting to see how people respond to my house because I feel like some people are like, oh yeah, he's like an endearing, kind of hapless guy. And some people are like, he's a fucking villain. <laughs> he's so awful. Um, and so I hope that all my coworkers feel like it's me. He's an endearing, hapless guy. Um, but yeah, again, like there's nothing... Uh, it's not like a bounty the company I've worked for, and it's not like there's one person I've worked with who's very much like Lily, who's the co worker character, who's like always kind of who's the, the more talented person who's always calling Miles in this shit. Um, and ultimately, just like kind of leaves because she's like, Why are we fucking doing this? This is really stupid, and like, I'm not even doing what I'm good at. I want to do anymore. Um, and the way she talks with him is such, is so much the way my friend she used to talk to me. <laughs> like, I love her. It was great. It was such a, like, it's like so refreshing to meet someone who, like, 
has a really strong sense of themselves and like knows what they want and knows how to express that want and like doesn't really get tangled up in your like I'm pretty needy person so it doesn't get tangled up in my neediness you know uh, and it's just kind of like no no it's you like you know <laughs> that's it um, so in the, in the very least I don't you read it and like feels complimented by it because it's ultimately a very um, loving uh, it's a lot of love that he's writing that character um, so yeah it's something that makes super scary that everybody will read I mean like because it's a dark book and because there's some horrible things that happen in it I don't want people to read it and be like oh like he loves these horrible things <laughs> um, but I don't think hopefully I have generosity toward people and assume that they will <laughs> understand what's going on and um, yes Oh, wow. Uh, it's a lot. I'm getting it. I think they took away everything. Um, I, again, it depends on the person. Because it's like, I feel like for me, the thing that I needed to be reminded of uh, was the, the power that each individual person has in on to affect all the people around them. Um, and especially as you, like, get more, as you get older and you get, like, better jobs and your people's bosses and, like, you're, or you're working in tech when you're, like, influencing all these users daily lives. Um, it's, like, taking that responsibility seriously and taking into account the humans, the human beings on the other end of that. Um, and it's, like, making that a sort of, like, a daily practice of reminding yourself to pay attention to that aspect of, like, your presence in the world. Um, that would be the thing that I was weak for myself, which is like thinking about a lot. Um, uh, I think there's, you know, what else do I want people to take away from the book? Uh, love your family. You know? <laughs> uh, do it when you can. Um, um, and that, like, you know, there's a lot of Life is a very large thing. It's very, very complicated. Um, and like taking those applications and those messages seriously in the moment doesn't necessarily mean that you have to solve them or that you like even can at that particular moment. Um, but there is something to be said just acknowledging them and acknowledging the difficulty of them and looking at the pieces of them and sharing them with people in your life. Um, and that is the first value in that. Um, but also there's value in the sort of like self-motivating movement to make change, which like Miles does not do. And hopefully people would not want to be Miles, you know. Um, one big to your question like what I was reading, another big influence on the book is this short story, The Swimmer. Um, like this John uh, Schieber story, I think it is. Um, yeah. And it's this like it's a story where this guy is just swimming, he's like, I'm gonna go. I'm going to swim through all the pools in my neighborhood from where I am now to, like, back to my home. Uh, and because he used to be this great swimmer. And he's just swimming through all these pools and all these pool parties. And this is very, like, surreal. Like, everybody from his kind of sees everybody from his life. And, like, all the people he used to hang out with kind of goes from party to party. He's swimming and swimming and swimming. And then he gets home. And, like, his house is empty and his family is gone. You know, and it's just like, it's like the end of the year arrives at the end of his life. Um, and that was a big influence on the book because it was like just one of those things of like um, trying to prove yourself to yourself uh, creates the situation where you're only the feedback loop is just you and you and with everything that's around you that you may love or may value or maybe trying to like focus on yourself in order to improve yourself to improve those relationships like those are continuing on at the same rate that you're like focusing on yourself. Uh, so yeah, okay. paying attention to your impact on other people I think is the biggest thing that I would like to convey. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, that's it. Oh, yeah.
it's a great question, and, and I think it kind of it does change uh, from project to project. And in this one, a big thing for me was just you know, realizing that like, because the world is catching up with the, the sort of things in the book, uh, that I suddenly had a responsibility to reality, where I was like, oh, I need to like people are going to compare this this VR stuff to actual things that are happening now versus it being like this sort of like exaggeration. Um, so we have to like think about yeah, the sort of like, practical side of that, like how would you make this or how would they pitch it? Or, like how would they talk about it? How long would it take? Um, so that was a big for me just a personal shift because normally I'm very comfortable operating in the like other space. So it just looks like the world that's completely asked itself as a work of the imagination. And this is one where I was like, it's very much work of the imagination. And the world was like, not so much. No, we are right. You know, how do you account for it? Um, I mean, it still feels so uh, un- un- impossible. Like, yeah. in the New York Times review, because you know that he was in the New York Times, um, the person had said, like, um, that they were in the margins, like, this isn't possible, right? This can't actually, this can't actually happen, right? <laughs> so there is, you, you do still feel like um, it's, it's, a, it's a possibility, it's a future that's not quite with us. I don't know if that's enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a certain anxiety about what these things could become. You know? mm-hmm. like, and it, that anxiety is based on there being some element of truth, but then, like, yeah, um, it being a little bit, it being, like, playing out of fear, you know, versus, like, being just playing out what's in front of you. And I think that's the, the fundamental the answer to your question, ultimately, is like, what is the description of this thing really about? And for me, it is very much about the complement and, like, the world feeling hard to identify or locate in reality, always feeling kind of like a little, you know, like once you get your hand on it, you shift a little bit down, and shit, like this, that was more complicated than I thought it was, there was more to this than I thought there was, or that's not at all what I thought it was, that, you know, there's this great, I remember talking to Brian Evans who once said it, you know, it was very much like this, and he was like, I was trying to catch that feeling, he's like, I walked into a parking lot once, and I saw this bird land, and then uh, the wind blew, and the bird turned into a bag, and I realized it was a bag. That I was looking at. And he's like, I always thought my story is to recreate that moment of when the bird turned into a bag. You know, neither the bird nor the bag or what I want is that moment. Um, and like, I think you're, if you're writing to that kind of like, to experience, to like, about the uh, experience of, of being a human, um, then how specific the like reality you're describing is, is really kind of just a tool to get at that. Feeling that bafflement, that insanity, that that love, that like whatever it is that I have to express, which rarely is, you know, just a description of technical things. Yeah. 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 I just spoke to Doug. Um, I, do, I don't outline fiction. Um, I do like, I do some screenwriting, and I always outline that um, because I get like, totally lost. And there's like way more. It, there's like just I feel like I have less of like a sort of uh, physical like muscle memory uh, around like the structure of screenplays, and so it's like I'm kind of reminding myself exactly where things need to go. And with a novel, it's either muscle memory or it's like I've given up on that the desire for a very specific structure. It doesn't matter so much in a novel if I like just fucking do whatever I want, you know. Um, and so for this particular book, I, I was working full time and so and I was swimming every day at the dolphin club in San Francisco, which is like out some open water swimming. And so I would go out there and I would swim, I'd get really, really cold and get in the sauna and then my brain would just go, you know, white. And then uh, I would go sit in that bed, right, for like an hour or whatever I could get out. And so a big part of it was that weird um, coming back into my body sensation from that experience, but also knowing that I only have, you know, 55 minutes, 54 minutes, 53 minutes to get something done. 
Uh, and so that's part of why the relationship is right. It's part of why it's, like, it's written in this, like, uh, hopefully, the way that it hopefully reads really quickly because I was just ultimately trying to keep myself engaged as fully as possible for that 15 minute period before I had to get the bus to work. Um, and yeah, so that was, that was like, the whole book came out like that. And then I would, when I wasn't tired, I would like work meeting on it. Um, but it was, it was very different from my other books, which usually the first draft is somewhere around the page count that it winds up being. And it's like largely a matter of just kind of tweaking you know, sections and stuff when we do the edits. This book was 70 pages when I wrote it. And then I was like, here's my email. And I gave it to some friends who read it. And they asked me some questions. Like, one of my first readers was like, why does Miles love his wife? And I was like, oh, this is fucking awesome. And like, but that doesn't work because that's not, that's, I can't be there every time someone reads it. And like, this isn't fucking awesome. And so I was like, I had to like, <laughs> go back in and add all of the stuff that was like about, you know, it, how they fell in love, what their love really is like. And are they still in love? And were they more in love at a different point than they are now? You know, and what was the shape of that? Why does he love her? Um, and that was, you know, another 70 pages or so. Um, and then there was like a, you know, another question from another reader. And it wound up just kind of, every time I would get back, it felt like the book was revealing more of itself to me. Um, and then it got to this place that had a sense like a much better sense of balance and much deeper book to me. And I also felt like it read faster suddenly. I guess the 70 pages were kind of a slog to get through. And now, for some reason, the 300 is like, or the 270 is like much quicker to, to get through. So I feel like I've done something right in this particular situation. Um, so it was, yeah, I guess this one was really different because of that like stages of like adding more content. Because uh, every other time I've tried to go back and do that, it's pretty miserable. You know, even like the, the sort of like the thing I was telling you of like, I wrote like a whole 200 pages of just like about this user, like in his house, you know? <laughs> it's just like good to imagine, but nobody wants to read this. You know, it's like ready to kind of want to watch like a video game fun part of it. <laughs> it's just in and not like when the day go. You know? <laughs> this is kind of dark. Um, so I got that. But you're moving out on the users too. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>